All right. Hello, hello. Let's welcome all the candidates up to my virtual stage, please and thank you. Come on, let's pretend like we're all just walking up and taking a seat. We'll just wait one second. Hi, everybody. I'm Jen Stojkovic here with SF City. Do you guys like my little makeshift makeshift office? Kind of some sense of normalcy in this very strange time. Thank you for joining us uh, for our first debate this year. Very, very exciting stuff. Uh, tonight, the leading District 1 supervisor candidates will face off in our first debate of 2020 with incumbent District 1 supervisor Sandra Lee Fewer vacating her seat. This is one of the hottest races in San Francisco. With San Francisco facing so many challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic, including a budget deficit, record unemployment, a restaurant and retail industry on the brink of collapse, a fleeing tech workforce, and an unprecedented pandemic. This is uh, quite a job to take on. So we are very excited to hear um, everyone's visions for how we are going to shape the future of this city. So I'm going to go over a few quick, quick housekeeping notes um, for tonight's debate, and then uh, we will turn it over and get started. First and foremost, Tonight will be divided into a few sections. Bear with me, I've got a list of rules. So for our moderated questions, candidates will have 90 seconds to answer and 30 seconds for a rebuttal if their name is mentioned. For our lightning round, candidates will have 30 seconds to answer and no rebuttal. Lastly, candidates will have 45 seconds to answer the questions. At the end of the night, we'll have closing statements and helping to keep track of time tonight, SF City's Zach Drucker, you want to give us a little cameo for a second, Zach? Hello, hello. He will be our timekeeper for tonight. So you will see him hold up a 30 second sign and a 10 second sign to keep us all on track. So if you want to participate in tonight's conversation, you can add a question below in the Q&A box. Everybody's pretty familiar with Zoom at this point. So please feel free throughout tonight's conversation to throw some questions in the Q&A. We also have a Facebook Live that's going to be running. So if you're joining us on Facebook Live, we will be monitoring tonight's conversation and pulling questions from there as well. Of course, we will make every effort to get to as many questions as possible. This debate is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. So if you miss something nitty gritty, don't worry. It is recorded and you will be able to rewatch it like the crazy San Francisco policy wonk that you must be. Lastly, this is my plug for social media. So if you have any thoughts about tonight's discussion, please share your thoughts using the hashtag SF forward and tagging SF city. You'll see Jackie from our team has also stuck it into the chat. All right. So everybody feeling good? We're all, we're all awake. Okay. All right. We're going to get started. So our first question of the night, I will list, we're gonna start alphabetically. So I will list um, starting with Andrew, then going Connie, David, Marjan, and Veronica. I want each of you to imagine you've just been elected District 1 supervisor. You have won in convincing fashion. You have a mandate and a board that is eager to work with you. Well, maybe. What policy are you proposing the first week in office who would oppose that idea and how would you navigate that opposition? Let's start with you, Andrew. Um, well, thanks for inviting me uh, to this uh, debate forum for SF City. Um, so um, if I were to be elected BOS for District 1 um, you um, in a convincing fashion, I think the first thing I'm gonna be tackling is public health and safety during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, making sure that we have adequate funding uh, to make sure that our residents in District 1, Richmond District, um, have the proper tools available to them as far as face masks, making sure we educate our citizenry, our citizenry as far as social distancing, um, make sure we address the issue of homelessness um, that's on the rise in our, in our district, um, because a lot of those folks um, don't have face masks. Um, we don't really understand where they stand as from a health standard, uh, whether they do carry COVID-19 or they may be asymptomatic carriers. Um, I understand that um, our, our budget right now is, is 12 plus billion dollars. So we're the richest city in the country. However, 
um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a loss of 2.1 billion um, that's gonna be happening over the next two years. So it's gonna be up to me, um, even though I have a mandate to make sure I'm working with the other board of supervisors um, specifically when it comes to public health and safety uh, to make sure not only my district is safe, but that we keep the city, the city of San Francisco safe and we help, we help to bend the curve uh, so that we can return to some sort of normalcy. So it's going to take a collective effort, mandate or not, and working together to make sure this happens. Thank you, Andrew. Connie? Um, I think uh, what I would probably do, um, likely to do actually, is to tackle the budget deficit, um, even as the member of the board of supervisors, knowing that we are facing $1.7 billion uh, budget deficit in the next two years. And right now, because you know we have uh, postponed it, the budget uh, agreement um, to August at this time, and knowing that the budget will pass in September, but quickly we're gonna see you know, uh, the results of the tax revenue measures, uh, what will that, how would that impact the city budget, um, as well as to see the fact that uh, what hopefully November election will turn out for White House to see what kind of funding and resources that we can get from the federal level, both on the state and San Francisco. And so to tackle the first thing probably is really the budget and talking to you know, uh, city workers, um, and different stakeholders to make sure that we maintain the level of city services uh, for the entire city, uh, definitely in January, because quickly another fiscal year will be coming in June. Um, and so that would be the first thing that I tackle. And I think that the reality is, while there will be many different opinions of how we tackle this budget, um, you know, because we're San Franciscans, uh, we definitely have a lot of opinions. Um, but I think that the reality is we all do know, both on uh, the mayor's office and the board, so Supervisors know that we need to work together. So I look forward to seeing that happen. Thank you, David. And you're muted. <laughs> Our first Zoomism of the night. <laughs> uh, I agree with Andrew. I believe that the homeless issue in our district is a very um, serious issue. It's a public health issue. It will be with us uh, even in November or January of next year. Um, I think I would pass legislation that would hold the mayor's office and the department's uh, heads accountable. I live uh, just down the street from the Alexandria Theater. For the last uh, six months, we were told that uh, the homeless tents, uh, which numbered over 10 or 15 tents, uh, over 20 people. Uh, recently, there was a, a report of a, a sex offender that a registered sex offender that was inhabiting uh, one of the tents, uh, that we were told that uh, uh, it was not possible to move those tents uh, because of um, CDC recommendations that would spread uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, issue. And uh, what we found overnight, just because of the work of neighbors and people in the, um, on, my, on my block, that they were able to clean up that street um, I would pass legislation that would demand accountability and uh, set a timeline for the mayor's office and department heads to move homeless uh, populations out of the Richmond and into hotel rooms uh, where they can um, be um, treated for uh, mental health and uh, drug addiction issues and to uh, resolve to help address the public health uh, crisis that we are facing in San Francisco. Thank you. Marjan? Uh, so the first thing I would do uh, if elected um, would be basically to bring City Hall to the Richmond, um, to bring the relevance and um, the kind of organizing um, uh, leverage that one has when one is elected as the local leader for the neighborhood straight to the neighbors and the local businesses. Um, I would ask um, my opponents, people who didn't support me and people who did support me to really come together um, to kind of address these major issues that are facing our neighborhood. Um, we've started a neighborhood summit already on the campaign and have hundreds of neighbors working in working groups, um, tackling homelessness, housing, small business, health and family wellness, um, you know, because Unfortunately, we won't, this won't be the end of COVID-19 by January. I wish I could say that it were, um, but we need to make sure that we emerge from this both physically healthy and as fiscally healthy as possible. Um, to Connie's point in talking about um, the budget, um, I think in, in 
um, specific areas, particularly, particularly homelessness and housing, um, we're going to need to conduct uh, audits, uh, as well as an analysis on where there are duplicative services. Because, you know, not just through these forums, but um, even in neighborhood conversations we've been having, there are, there's a lot of talk about what needs to happen on homelessness. And meanwhile, for several months, we've had several encampments here in the Richmond. Um, some have been resolved and come back, uh, but I think we really need to bring the neighbors or bring City Hall to the neighborhood uh, to really tackle these problems. And that's the approach I would take. Thank you. Veronica? Well, the first thing I would do, again, very similar to what my opponent said, is open an office, a supervisorial office here in the district so that our constituency can reach us 24 seven versus having to go to City Hall where there is no parking and lack of transportation. But second of all, we have to start looking at our economy. The reality is unemployment is at an all time high. This pandemic has taken a toll on our budget and we have to start talking about relief, recovery and resilience, how we get our economy back in place. But one of the other things I wanna do once we get to the Board of Supervisors is look at universal basic income. And you know, proposing you know, to look into options like that. Already cities like Oakland and Stockton are already doing the research. They're putting this on, on their agenda and they're looking at really assisting our low wage earners. And that's something I think San Francisco needs to start looking into is really investing in our residents, investing in our community one person at a time, especially our low wage earners in the city that are currently struggling with unemployment, with the $600 extra a week that has gone they're struggling to feed their family. They're struggling to pay their rent. And now we're gonna see, you know, a wave of evictions. And so we, as San Franciscans, we really need to learn how we learn, live within our means in this city. And that means government needs to learn how to live within its means, by not forgetting our residents and not on the back of our low income wage earners here in the city. Thank you. As a reminder to everybody, you're going to hear from me a couple times tonight. Please make sure to drop any questions into that Q&A or that Facebook live stream. All right, we will start now with Connie. Due in large part to the COVID-19 induced recession, San Francisco is staring down an anticipated $1.7 billion budget deficit over the next two fiscal years, as referenced by some of you. As a primary response to the recession, the city is looking to significantly raise business taxes. There is much debate over these measures as many businesses have seen a significant drop off in revenue and major layoffs, and many staunchly oppose an increase in taxes. Do you support this plan to increase taxes on business? Why or why not? We'll start with you, Connie. Thank you, I do. I, I think that during this pandemic, the reality is, um, many people actually see a different impact. And frankly, uh, a statistic that I'm learning is that American billionaires are making, uh, generating more than $500 billion during this pandemic. That's the profit that they have made. And the American corporation have received more than $135 billion of tax bailout in San Francisco Bay Area alone, more than 263, um, tech companies has received paycheck production program loans uh, upward uh, from between anywhere uh, $2 million up to $10 million each. We know that this is not fair, uh, especially for the small business that is, to, that is the backbone to our local economy. And what we really need to do with these tax revenue measure is making sure that billion dollars corporation pay their fair share. And with that, uh, we provide relief, relief for our small businesses that are generating $2 million and less. And that, you know, relief for um, food, uh, restaurants, grocery stores, and retail trades. And I believe that with that, we can really uh, together build back the economy in San Francisco. Thank you. David? Uh, I oppose the uh, taxes, uh, the tax increase during the COVID-19 uh, for that hurt middle class uh, residents of the Richmond district, particularly small business owners. Uh, I've heard from many small business owners, the $2 million threshold is too low. Uh, as you know, uh, this is a gross receipts, it's gross earnings, and a lot of uh, small business owners um, um, are make paper thin margins. And uh, $2 million, is and they have multiple locations. So if you have two locations, uh, each one earning a gross million, you're already there. Uh, plus the, the uh, gross receipts tax, which started out as a revenue neutral measure from the mayor's office now is something that's going to raise uh, $97 million a year. 
Uh, where does that money come from? It comes from businesses. Uh, it's going to drive business out of San Francisco. Your billionaire's tax that um, uh, was mentioned uh, will not tax a single billionaire. It will tax uh, corporations, uh, particularly in the struggling hotel industry, that will push them out of San Francisco, just as our uh, low and middle income residents of the Richmond need jobs. Uh, my students, I'm an educator, uh, are graduating uh, into a job market that is incredibly uh, tight and difficult. And uh, we need uh, employment opportunities for um, our students and for the future of San Francisco. And these taxes are the wrong uh, move at the wrong time. Thank you. Marja? Uh, I do support the tax measures on the ballot. Um, I think it's important to recognize um, the timing isn't right for any of this right now. It's not the right time for a pandemic. It's not the right time for people to be losing jobs. Um, it's, it's very bad timing. It's not the right time for there to be fires, right? Um, I don't think in general that we can tax ourselves out of these situations. I think the tax measures on the ballot now um, are a result of collaboration between the mayor and the board of supervisors around a band-aid solution. Um, some of them do have um, fail safes to see if it is even worth implementing the tax um, within a year. And I think there's a lot of wait and see there. Uh, but I think in the future, you know, we didn't find ourselves in this financial situation overnight. Um, you know, I think that for many of the issues we're facing as a city, um, it's a result of decades, 20, 30, 40 years um, of mismanagement and lack of vision uh, around how um, this city should look for the future around housing, around how we're serving our um, unhoused population, uh, how we're investing in infrastructure. And what's happening is this tension was created prior to the pandemic. Due to the pandemic, we're now forced to reckon with the choices we made before. Um, and these are some of the solutions coming out of City Hall. But in general, I don't advocate um, for those kinds of taxes. But given where we are, um, I am supporting them. Thank you. Veronica? You know, I'm a small business owner. My parents have been in the restaurant business since 1989. My three out of 10 of my family members have small business in the city. Do I support tax increases? Usually no, but because of the economic struggles that we're facing, we need to look at increases. But unfortunately, this is the reality of this passes. Businesses will leave the city. And when businesses leave the city, that means we receive less revenue on sales tax. And the city and county of San Francisco depends a lot on property tax and sales tax revenue. So if those are gone, like Adidas is leaving San Francisco, Macy's is leaving San Francisco, people will shop in other counties, which means a San Franciscan that goes to Ceremony Mall and the shops there, the revenue goes to San Mateo County, not San Francisco. So we really got to start looking at really how we get our money and how we spend our money. And that's the transparency and accountability that City Hall has been missing. So we really need to start looking at how we're spending that money that we have been getting and, we'll, and the money that we will not be getting, we can't put it on the backs of our working class. And the reality is, you know, a lot of these billionaires that we keep talking about do not have residency here in San Francisco and they're gonna take their business elsewhere. So where do we leave these young folks who are graduating? I have a 21 year old son, where do they go to work? How do we get our revenues with the sales tax if there are no businesses for people to shop? These are all valid questions that we need to look at before these tax policies are implemented. Thank you. Andrew? Oh, you're uh, muted. Um, to echo what my uh, opponent, uh, Veronica, just said, I think this is a very complicated issue because of the pandemic. So being probably one of the only people um, running for D1 uh, BOS ha who has worked in corporate America and works in tech, um, it is complicated. So on the one hand, uh, we do want these billionaires that own companies like Uber, Salesforce, um, Slack, uh, to be able to pay their fair share when it comes to taxes. However, with those taxes, um, during this pandemic, things are complicated. So with those taxes, they still need to be paid. We've seen thousands of people being laid off, young people, um, and, and a mass exodus of these people out of the city. And, and also these companies are, are leaving the city because they can't afford to be here. 
So we need to relook at um, both the property tax and the sales tax that we have so that we do encourage these businesses to stay here so they, they can continue to offer these jobs to young people who are coming out of college, um, who are graduating from high school, whether it's an internship or it's a job as a tech engineer, as a salesperson, um, these companies add a lot of value, hundreds of millions of dollars to our, to our revenue. Um, but also we need to have responsibility at City Hall in terms of how they're spending this money. So I think it's one of these things where I don't wanna see small businesses affected in my, in my district in Richmond um, with these property and sales tax. But at the same time, we need to also look at what this means for corporate America in our city and the kind of revenue and job, and job growth they can offer to us um, during this pandemic. So I think we need to first get out of, go ahead, sorry. Thank you, Andrew. With remote work and online learning becoming a staple of quarantine life, the issue of the digital divide, you guys knew this one was coming, it has become front and center in San Francisco. As supervisor, what major steps would you take or support to address the digital divide in our city? I'm gonna start with you, David. Yes. Um, I work in um, higher ed at San Francisco State and uh, we are literally living what you're um, describing because our students, our campus is closed. Uh, our students are taking their classes online and uh, we recognize very rapidly that many students don't have uh, internet access. Even if we're providing uh, laptop computers to them, uh, they don't have uh, internet access at home. They don't have fast uh, enough access to um, engage in the kind of online learning that our instructors or professors are uh, preferred to teach in. And there is a, a huge digital divide. Uh, a few years ago, we were looking in the city at uh, municipal Wi-Fi. Uh, this is an idea at, at, San, at San Francisco uh, Rec and Park when I was a commissioner uh, there for seven years that we looked at for all the parks to provide free Wi-Fi uh, throughout Golden Gate Park and throughout um, uh, uh, recreation areas. Uh, this is an idea that is time uh, is now to um, we should be looking at again because uh, we need um, to close the digital divide by providing free municipal access all over San Francisco. And that's something that we can do uh, as a city. Uh, we are one of the most technologically advanced cities, uh, digitally connected cities uh, in the Bay Area, uh, in the state. Uh, we can do this. And I think we need to prioritize it and um, move the legislation along to make it happen. Thank you. Marjan? Um, so I think in general, um, our city has been um, too slow. Um, there hasn't really quite been the political will around um, taking on these challenges with universal broadband. I think this pandemic um, uh, has really highlighted where we have some real weaknesses there and we need to prioritize digital ac access um, if we're going to support a modern and education workforce. Um, so I would definitely push for um, free, free um, broadband um, so that we're closing that equity gap. Um, I think in the meantime, you know, I co-founded our local merchants association and have been working um, with some neighbors on the no one left offline initiative, which, you know, neighbors have come together to work with nonprofits and local businesses to um, uh, To work with businesses so that they can expand, you know, to get special routers so that they could expand their um, Wi Fi past the kind of property line. Right. Um, and, you know, now it's a little bit difficult because people aren't hanging out in cafes, but I think that's the kind of innovative thinking that we need to look at while we work on getting free access for all residents and students and um, those who don't have the funds to pay, right? It should be accessible to everyone to really close that equity gap. Um, but I'm very grateful for that innovative thinking because we don't really have any more time to waste. And we're seeing it now with, um, you know, school starting online, you know, some students have better Wi-Fi than others and we feel it acutely uh, in our home as well. Thank you. Veronica? I have a son who's in fifth grade and has attends Lafayette. And we were fortunate because of his school to pick up a Chromebook and a hotspot. But the reality, it was this semester that kids were able to pick up a hotspot to be able to learn from home. The reality is this digital divide has shown us that we have a huge social economic also divide. 
And while our children went to school, no one knew, you know, who was low income, who was a billionaire, who was middle class. But now we do, because not every child has a laptop. Not every child has internet. Again, my son was very fortunate to be able to pick up both a hotspot and a laptop at his public school. But that doesn't mean every public school right now has that option. So City Hall has talked about converting this whole city into a hotspot for the last 15 years. It's not anything new we haven't been talking about, but it hasn't been an urgent issue and it needs to be treated urgently now, not only for our students, but also for our small business owners who right now can't really pay for internet because they're trying to pay their rent. And that means they don't have, you know, their website to place to go orders or receive to go. So we need to really look at, you know, converting the city into internet friendly for everyone, for our seniors, for our small business owners, for our students, and not making it affordable, making it free. I mean, we live in San Francisco, you know, they always say you breathe the air here, you get smarter. I don't know if that's true anymore. I've not heard that one. Thank you, <laughs> Andrew. <coughs> uh, you're muted, yeah. Uh, coming from a corporate technology background, um, I understand how important it is having internet access consistently, specifically now during the pandemic when me and 5,000 other of my colleagues are working from home. One of the things that I've recognized and, and, and know about personally is when you grow up in a situation where you may not have the resources where some of the other kids you go to school have when it comes to having a laptop, having, having high speed internet access. Um, an example is my own nephew, um, he's fortunate. My, both of his parents, my brother and my sister-in-law, they're lawyers, they went, they went and got, they, they live a pretty good life, so he has access and most of his classmates have it too. But when you look at neighborhoods like Bayview Hunters Point, and you look at the opposite side of Fillmore, of Fillmore District, uh, away from California in the corner of Fillmore, you start to see that digital divide. So this is, this is a public crisis and it's a socioeconomic crisis, um, not only for uh, our district here when it comes to low income and working class families, but in the city as well. Um, we need to, if in fact I do get to the Board of Supervisors District 1, this is one of my main priorities is making sure that all kids have access to internet and all of them have the ability uh, to work uh, remotely during this pandemic. And, and parents that can't afford it, we need to make sure that the kids still have the opportunity to learn in the same way as their, as their classmates do and other kids that are in other richer districts in the city of San Francisco. Thank you. Connie? Um, actually, my, my son and Veronica's kid go to the same school. In fact, we saw each other when we picked up the Chromebook that day and I'm very fortunate to be able to have a school system that is really supportive and trying their best um, so that my son at, during this pandemic can uh, continue distance learning and it's his education. But I think that San Francisco has been trying. In fact, we have been doing this, um, it's called and I'm just learning that too. And it's about fiber to, to housing partnership with Monkey Brain uh, with the city and county of San Francisco. And what we're doing is really building the infrastructure. That is what we need, the infrastructure so that we build in this so that we can actually uh, have options for digital uh, you know, in, uh, connections in the long run. And I think that's a great uh, model. The model is basically, you know, having Monkey Brain come in and, and building a public housing or, you know, our, our affordable housing developments to build in the infrastructure so that the tenants, especially a, a lot of them are, are low income tenants, actually have that option. And I think that's what we need to do to continue and expand those partnerships into our school sites. When we have a school bond, we should really, you know, think about allocating funding to build in that infrastructure for digital um, connection in the down in the future. And that would same goes with rec and parks, our recreation centers and open space sites, and perhaps on the different blocks and uh, of our business corridors so that our small business too will be able to have an option uh, through the infrastructure that we invest as a community and as a city. Thank you. In San Francisco, you cannot have a discussion about the future of our city without discussing our most critical issue, homelessness. Over the last decade, San Francisco's population of individuals experiencing homelessness has nearly doubled, and that was before the pandemic. Taking a look at other cities across the country and the world, 
name one thing that you would do in San Francisco to meaningfully address the homelessness crisis. We will start with you, Marjan. Um, so I think the bottom line around homelessness is we need to lead with compassion in how we work with and support our unhoused residents. Um, you know, looking at things like safe parking sites, safe sleeping villages, um, acquiring more shelter beds, um, permanent supportive housing, you know, really housing at all levels so that um, living on the street is not an option for people, right? I mean, we need to be able to um, provide um, how, uh, options for shelter, uh, options to treat um, mental illness as well as substance use, uh, and then ways to help these individuals get back on their feet and live independently. And for those who can't, um, to um, provide the kind of support and wraparound services um, that I think is very important. Um, you know, you'll hear a lot of different arguments around how we got here um, and why um, there are such there are thousands and thousands of unhoused residents in San Francisco. Uh, but I think you know, there's no arguing that we have a housing shortage and we need housing at all levels. Um, it's both 100% affordable, um, uh, low income housing, affordable house, um, uh, market rate housing, right? So that we can fund all types of housing. And I think over the past few decades, we haven't done enough of that, uh, which is resulting in individuals living on the street, which is not dignified or humane, and we can do much better as a city. So um, I think by providing those services and really taking a hands-on approach to addressing person by person, what their needs are, um, you know, that would be my first step as supervisor. Thank you. Veronica? You know, the, our unhoused population has been an issue that's been going on for 30 years, and it's something we talk about every election year. But what I think what the city and county needs to do is get the right data. It's not just counting those who are currently unhoused, but those who are on the verge of being unhoused. Those who are living couch to couch that don't have a residency that are living from friends and friends' house, are musicians, independent contractors, those who live, you know, who commute from LA to work in San Francisco for two, three months, end up staying here and have no place to live. We need to get the correct data first so that we get the appropriate funding at the state and federal level to meet the needs of our unhoused community. My priority with the unhoused community is one person at a time. And with me, it starts with our foster care children. It starts with making sure that the laws that's being proposed at the state level, we change the law from 21 to 25 so that we see less children on our streets that are unhoused, making sure they have an opportunity to succeed before they become, you know, unhoused. Because when chronic homelessness starts, it, there is no end to it. Now, I've said this before, if you are a student in San Francisco public school, you should not be unhoused. That is a failure in government. So we really not, need to start addressing this one person at a time with compassion and urgency because it's become a public health issue, not a homeless issue, a public health issue that needs to be addressed. And that needs to be addressed by changing our current laws to really put social services first and building housing at all income levels. Thank you. Andrew? You, hold on, you're muted. Um, great question. And again, this, this is a question that has many layers. I'm probably not going to be able to get into it, but um, here's the thing. So um, homelessness is obviously a, an epidemic that has been in our city for quite some time, and we haven't been able to solve it. We dump mil hundreds of millions of dollars, up to $300 million at a time per year, but yet we see no results. The homelessness seems to increase, and particularly in my district, I've seen over the last couple of years that homelessness has increased. Uh, looking at 18th and Geary, we have encampments. You look at the corner of 6th and Geary by the Muni bus stop, uh, we have homeless people laying there, there are drug needles all over the place, and that's just not acceptable. Um, we, we need to figure out a way uh, to tackle this. And I think, uh, unfortunately, um, we're not being tough enough when it comes to homelessness. I think our city has a lot of social programs that incentivize people to come to San Francisco um, to take advantage of those programs. And in that, uh, we, we have an increase of homelessness and an influx. Um, and right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's a particular health and public safety issue because again, we're trying to tamp down uh, something that has the ability to dramatically change our city uh, from, the, from, uh, from what it's supposed to be. So my whole thing is that 
it's not about dumping more money. It's about being smart in terms of how we're going to, we're going to address and fix this problem moving forward. I don't think it's a money issue. I think it's an idea issue and we need to figure out the best way to move forward to fix this. Thank you. Connie. You know, I, I, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a mom, you know, with a second grader and, you know, when we walk around the Richmond, sometimes I do understand, you know, the challenges uh, to how to explain about homelessness to my kid. My partner, he's a firefighter in the city and uh, from time to time, he too tackled the issue about the homeless populations when he go out for calls. So those things are that definitely my family is experiencing on a first hand and have understanding that it's challenging. Uh, nonetheless, we should be compassionate. Uh, uh, with our homeless residents in San Francisco. Uh, for too often, I, I think that the best um, solution to homelessness, to solve homelessness, is the fact that we need to um, prevent it from happening at first place. That means let's invest, making sure that our tenants can stay housed, including you know, fully uh, fund our tenants' legal counsel so that they can tackle those some of the issues, especially during this pandemic with eviction moratorium, um, and that they can, uh, we have invest in small sites acquisition program that is to buy a small apartment building so that we can stabilize rents for the tenants that are already living there. Now, I think that immediate term that we should continue to extend hotel rooms for those who are currently on the streets so that they can actually safely social distance and eat necessary quarantine during this pandemic. Um, and when we can, and we're going to, because we're going to invest in this bond that it's coming up in November to provide $180 million or more, you know, for supportive long-term support of housing. And so those are the things that our city should continue to do uh, to really solve this in the long term. Thank you. And David. Um, I, I don't support Band-Aid approaches to addressing the homeless uh, population. I have noticed uh, I'm the only candidate that is opposing navigation centers in the Richmond district. I believe uh, the $12.5 million that the city spent at the building the Embarcadero uh, Navigation Center, uh, that's only good for a couple of years um, uh, because of the, the nature of these uh, navigation centers are all temporary solutions, uh, could have been better uh, invested in purchasing a hotel room. Uh, hotels uh, and hotel rooms that are now uh, for sale because many of the hotels are in uh, distressed properties that the city can now purchase uh, and also get uh, through the state and federal aid uh, a subsidy program, a, a financial assistance to purchase permanent uh, housing solutions for the unhoused. And I would uh, suggest that uh, we have a problem of will rather than um, of money. Uh, we've been throwing money at the homeless, uh, addressing the homeless issue in our district for years. Uh, it is uh, not working, uh, but when there is political will, uh, it gets done. We saw it happen just this week, a few days ago, uh, when the um, homeless tent encampment at the Alexandria Theater that had been there for months, and we were told as residents that it cannot be, um, people cannot be moved. It was moved because residents uh, rose up and uh, made it happen, but it shouldn't take that. A supervisor should be the one leading the charge and making sure that the homeless uh, folks are housed and um, it recognize that this is a public health issue. Thank you. Okay, this is our last moderated yes. question. Can I quickly interject for a second? Uh, so I'm I sorry, just want to. No, Andrew, I'm sorry. We have to keep moving on. We've got a tight uh, timeline. It, okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, numbers continue to pour in each month about double digit drops in rent, and reports on the potential looming tech exodus become starker each day as more than 90% of the city's nearly 75,000 tech workers are working remotely, some potentially indefinitely. With the average tech worker generating $650,000 in economic impact to San Francisco's local small business community, how would you approach retaining tech workers as San Francisco residents as the shift to remote work reshapes the landscape of how companies do business? We will start with you, Veronica. Well, you know, I work for the state of California. One of our offices was on Spear Street. And before the pandemic, it was all tech workers. And they were shopping and, you know, spending money in cafes and, you know, sandwiches here, lunch there. They produce so much income for the city. 
again, sales tax is a huge component of our city revenue and that is gone. So you go to downtown right now, it is empty. And it's the reason why, because they're working from home. The reality is not all tech worker makes a lot of money. Not all of them are millionaires. Some of them are low wage earners. I have friends that start at 30, 40,000 and they cannot afford to live in the city. So we have to start with making affordable housing to make sure that this city is an inviting and inclusive place for all workers, working families, gig workers, young talent. And we rely on the young talent to come to San Francisco. They make up our night industry that is gone right now. So the reality is we have to make the city more affordable and it starts with housing. It's making sure that low cost alternative traditional housing like home shares and living co-ops are feasible and doable in the city. But unless we make the city affordable for them to live in, they're going to leave. I already have friends that have packed up their bags and gone to Seattle. And we're gonna see more and more of that if we don't change the way we uh, rely on affordable housing for everyone in the city. Thank you. Andrew? Um, again, um, I'll reiterate, um, as the only candidate here that, wor that works in tech and has been doing so for the last 13 years, um, it is different now. The pandemic has caused quite a dramatic shift in terms of how tech companies are considering their workforce now and in the future. So with a lot of the tech companies going remote, and a lot of the companies saying now, like Google, um, uh, I believe Facebook as well, and some other folks um, that are considered to be unicorn, unicorn uh, tech companies, um, they're saying you can permanently work from home. Um, and, and like Veronica just said, there are a lot of people that work in tech that are not making $100,000 a year plus. Um, when I started out in tech, I was making $34,000 a year. Now, obviously, I've been working in tech for quite some time. That may be different now, but we need to make sure that affordable housing is available for everybody, whether we're talking about our tech workers, our elderly, our low-income community, um, our, our working class community. So it's going to take a collective effort um, and me working with the other Board of Supervisors as well as the mayoral office to figure out a way to keep these folks in the city um, so that when the pandemic does subside, and maybe companies decide to come back in the city um, when, it, when it's feasible for them to do so, um, these folks are gonna have a place to live. Thank you. Connie? Well, you know, this has been the problem even before the pandemic, meaning like there were a lot of people already being priced out, working families, working people in San Francisco already finding it uh, very difficult to stay. And so it, it is now uh, experiencing across the board because of the pandemic, because of the increase of unemployment. And it is unfortunate and tragic. And uh, I do agree with the fact that it does mean that we need to make San Francisco Bay Area more affordable. And it really means that making sure that our billion dollars corporation pay their fair share. You know, frankly, you know, Airbnb is preparing for its IPO um, where, you know, uh, Twitter just really have its height of um, uh, its share jumped to 7.3% just in July. So we know that these tech companies are doing well, but the workers that they're not treating well, we see that Uber and Lyft are not treating their workers well. And so we do need to make sure that we organize the workers, making sure that they are having their rights and, uh, and that's what we need to do. And, but yes, we do need to build affordable housing, but then at the same time, uh, look at the fact that we have about possibly 10,000 up to 30,000 empty units uh, that is speculative investor holding onto. And that makes really us uh, having a hard time with our housing stock. I and mean, so we need to close that loophole and uh, build 100% affordable so that people can afford to live in San Francisco. Okay, David. Well, look, we could not choose whether or not to have uh, the COVID-19 epidemic. We did not choose or did not have a choice in having wildfires. Uh, but we do have a choice when it comes to taxes because those taxes that uh, are being proposed uh, this fall, this November, which will impact middle class, struggling people, tech companies uh, have middle class tech workers as well, low income, uh, struggling workers. Uh, we have a choice. 
um, this is not the right time to be increasing taxes uh, when people are struggling, when companies are leaving, uh, where w the workforce has already uh, left. Uh, we need to be looking at innovative solutions, uh, particularly uh, at cutting costs within um, city government. Our city government just five years ago had a budget of only eight, uh, mil eight billion dollars. And in that time, in those five years, now we have a budget of 12.5 billion. We're talking double digit increases in just the last few years. Uh, yet our population is the same. We have roughly 800,000 people. Our population has not grown dramatically in those five years. We have a lot of highly paid um, uh, 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 department heads and executives. We have also an overtime problem where we read that some 19 out of the 20 highest paid overtime earners came from the sheriff's department. Uh, we need to address the corruption issue in some of our departments, and we need to um, focus on cutting costs. Uh, there's a Thank lot you, of David. fat in the budget. Thank you, Marcia. Thanks. Uh, so tech workers leaving San Francisco, that is an issue. Tech workers are leaving San Francisco. Workers are leaving San Francisco. Families are leaving San Francisco. This started prior to the pandemic. And as I've said in prior comments, this pandemic has really forced us to take a long, hard look at how our actions over the past 30, 40 years have led us to where we are. You know, San Francisco has always been a place that has attracted small businesses, attracted young people, attracted families who wanted to live amongst the arts, beautiful weather, proximity to different, you know, landscapes, restaurants, and also just diversity and culture. Um, and now um, I, I think a lot of that is coming to a head. Um, you know, when we talk about tech workers, even the brick and mortar companies, right, are turning into tech companies, right? Their online presence has increased, you know. I run a retail shop with my sister. I wish we were doing a better job of that. But, you know, there's this transition of people can't physically come here. How do we give an online experience? Um, I think that we as a city are going to need to take a closer look at how we attract businesses, families, working people, people who want to raise their families here and retire here, because I think we've taken that for granted in boom times. And now we are faced with a reckoning, we're facing a recession and possibly a depression and really need to start stop um, kind of demonizing different industries and trying to point to this is the reason we are where we are. Well, it's a multi-layered, multifaceted reason around lack of investment in housing, transportation, small businesses and addressing um, our challenges with homelessness. Thank you. All right. Congratulations, everybody. You have survived the moderated question round. I'm feeling like a regular like Anderson Cooper over here. Okay. So just a reminder to everybody. Um, thanks for everyone that's sending in the Facebook live stream questions. Um, we've got some really good ones coming through. You can also drop them in the Q&A on Zoom if you are joining on Zoom. We are now going to move to the lightning round. Uh, and so with the lightning round, um, I will tell you who's going first. We will continue in the same alphabetical order. You will only have 30 seconds uh, to answer these questions. We're going a little bit faster and there will be no rebuttal. All right. Do you or agree or disagree that a solution for San Francisco's transportation issues includes expansion of micro mobility options such as scooters and e-bikes? We're gonna start with you, Andrew. Just a reminder, everyone, 30 seconds now. Okay, could you really quickly repeat the question? Do you agree or disagree that San Francisco transportation issues could be alleviated by expanding micro mobility options such as scooters and e bikes? Yes. Agree? Okay. Yes. Okay. Ronnie? <laughs> yes, but it has to be done in a safe, and affordable and accessible fashion to all communities, including you know people that have you know cultural and language um, challenges. Um, you know it requires cultural and language competency. David, um, no, I don't support expansion of um, micro transportation. Okay, Marsha. Uh, yes, uh, I do support. I think it's the perfect example of something where we could really tailor what each community wants and needs. Um, but I think it's just part of 
um, environmental sustainability and part of how um, this city is going to um, transition and embrace different modes of travel. I mean, for someone like me, I mean, I drive a minivan in normal times, right? Because there are a lot of kids to kind of drive around. Um, but, you know, having different options, I think, is very helpful and it needs to be done in a way that transcends socioeconomic status. Veronica? Yes, I think with COVID-19 gives us an opportunity to re-envision transportation and it needs to be done district by district, so it meets the needs of each community. But absolutely, I, I think it's great for the environment and great for our kids to get out there and actually be not, not be in a car. Thank you. With shelter space at capacity in San Francisco, the city has identified building navigation centers as a fast and low barrier way to help individuals. Currently, navigation centers are only in a few districts, despite the problem being a citywide issue. Do you support building a navigation center in every district in San Francisco, starting with you, Connie? I support building a navigation center in the Richmond. Do you support it in every single district in San Francisco? I think that it should address different needs um, in different districts, but definitely in the Richmond. We have a growing homeless population and we have that need. Okay, so yes or no? I, I think that is a challenging question, you know, uh, when it comes to every single district. And I can only, you know, respond on behalf of my assessment for the Richmond district. Okay, David? No. Okay, Marjan? So we've always heard that um, you need navigation centers where there's a need. Um, I think that we've seen a growing need in the Richmond district. And I think the arbitrary, and I'm so sorry, like I know you're asking in every district, if there's a need in every district, we need to meet the needs of the constituency. Um, I think that districts are kind of arbitrary. Those maps are kind of arbitrary and many people don't even know what district they live in, but they know if there are individuals who are experiencing homelessness that need help. So I think we need to have an openness to that. Um, and I do support, um, you know, having that transitional housing option to get people back on their feet, to get their minds straight, right? Um, and to be able to live a productive life. So, okay. I mean, yes, I know. <laughs> where it's needed, where it's needed. Okay, Veronica? Um, the, the answer for me for the Richmond, it's a mobile navigation center, but I think homelessness is a city issue and every district needs to take responsibility. There are unhoused individuals in every district, and if you may not see them, they are there. So it might not be a navigation center that a district needs, but it needs transitional housing, it may need something else to, you know, to address their unhoused population, but it is a city issue and every district needs to take responsibility for it. So yes. Yes. Great. And Andrew. Um, again, I think this is a complicated question. I'm going to say no to Richmond District. Um, and when it comes to the rest of the city, I'm going to say no until I have the buy-in uh, from those communities and the other Board of Supervisors agree. So that's my answer. No on okay. both counts. Okay. Thank you. At Tuesday's board meeting, District 4 Supervisor Gordon Marr introduced a resolution asking the Association of Bay Area Government, also known as ABAG, great acronym, to keep San Francisco's market rate I'm housing sorry. goals the same. Uh, Supervisor Marr says the city has already shouldered much of the region's housing development, and instead, San Francisco's market rate housing should be allocated to other cities. If you were on the board, would you vote in favor or against Super Mar Supervisor Marr's resolution? And in case, um, I'll just repeat that one more time. So Supervisor Marr has introduced a resolution to keep San Francisco's market rate housing goals the same. Support or oppose? David. I support it. Okay. Marjan? Um, I think if I understand the legislation correctly, because I have not read it, um, but you know, we're in a climate and fire crisis right now, and this would push more housing into fire zones. I think we need to look at the environmental impact of this um, and do our share as an urban area and to create housing in major transit corridors. So from what you have described, um, I would not support that. I mean, we have to build enough housing at all income levels uh, in San Francisco uh, instead of kicking the can down the road, pushing things into the suburbs, and then increasing the fire risk that we are all experiencing right now. 
Thank you. Veronica? Um, the way you describe it, no. I mean, we, San Francisco needs to build housing at all income levels and market rate is not affordable for your average San Franciscan. So that needs to be addressed. Okay. Andrew? Um, I'm going to echo Veronica. Uh, when it comes to market rate housing, um, that doesn't really work for uh, most residents uh, because of income levels. So I'm going to say, no, I don't support that. Okay. And Connie? I do support Supervisor Gordon Mart's legislation. We already hit 98% market rate housing production in San Francisco and then some. What we need is 100% affordable housing. And so I've wholeheartedly support Supervisor Gordon Mard's resolution. All right, thank you. In San Francisco, around 75% of the city is zoned only for single family housing. Would you be in support of upzoning around transportation and commercial corridors to increase the city's density? We'll start with you, Marjan. Um, yes, we need to make more investments also in transit corridors. There's been a lot of discussion about that in the Richmond um, and to be able to increase um, density where there is transit is the environmentally right thing to do uh, as we face climate change as we're experiencing it right now. Veronica? Yes, I think we, we have to look at our zoning laws. We have to make it easier for growing families to grow in their homes for seniors to age in their homes. And that's gonna require, you know, rezoning here in San Francisco. Okay, Andrew? Yes, I support it. I support the legislation. Connie? Uh, last year, uh, we have a Proposition E in 2019 for the workforce and educator housing. Basically, that piece of legislation allows the zoning of public land and private land for when, if, and when we build 100% affordable housing. That also means allowing density. So uh, I think we already have a law allowing us to do that as long as we build 100% affordable. It's also the reason why I support 100% affordable housing development. Okay, so you, you would support the upzoning for single family zoning? It's already done. So it's kind of what I'm saying. It's already done. Okay. I support a Prop E. So yes, as long as it's 100% okay. affordable housing. Okay. David? Yes, I, I would also support 100% affordable housing. I think uh, Prop E does address this issue. It's been answered. So there you go. Okay. As a way to reopen restaurants without letting customers inside, the city has implemented the widely utilized shared spaces program to allow restaurants to operate in public space next to their building. When the city begins to resume normal operations, would you support making some of the shared spaces permanent, even if it comes at the expense of parking spaces or transit lanes? We will start with you, Veronica. Yes, as a small business owner who owns a restaurant in the city, absolutely. But the reality is this is, has not worked for every restaurant in every district. It really depends where your restaurant is located, you're able to do it. My restaurant person, we can't do it as we're in the tenderloin. But as we move forward, that absolutely has to be an option for business to be able to survive after the pandemic. Andrew? Um, I'm gonna say, and you said, can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. As a way to reopen restaurants without letting customers inside, the city has implemented the utilized shared spaces program, which allows restaurants to operate in public space near their building. When the city begins to resume normal operations, would you support keeping some of these spaces permanent, even if it comes at the expense of parking spaces or transit lanes? I'm going to say Yes, but with the caveat that we do need to get buy-in, uh, not only from our local business, small business owners, but also from the residents in the community, because that's going to have a huge impact. We already have a parking shortage, so um, that's my answer. So yes. Okay. Connie? Conceptually, definitely it's a yes. Uh, we need to help our small business to continue to survive. I just don't know that, you know, I, I, I think that we need to talk about this so that it's not at the expense, definitely not at transit link. Uh, we need the transit links. And, um, and for some, especially seniors with, and people with disabilities, parking is valuable so that they can actually visit and patronize their favorite restaurants. So uh, yes but we might not at the expense of transit and parking at the moment. Okay, 
David? Um, this is a question that should be answered with, it depends. Um, because there are overriding uh, issues when it comes to disabled, elderly, uh, that uh, may take precedent over um, uh, the shared space issue. If, we, if our seniors cannot get in, cannot have accessibility, if transit cannot move efficiently and move lots of people efficiently, then no. Uh, but if we can do it without impacting uh, those uh, vulnerable populations or our transit lines that uh, thousands of people depend upon, uh, then yes. So the answer is, it depends. All right. Um, I'll take that as a, as a yes, if your qualifications are met. Marjan? So it's interesting you bring this up because this is actually happening right now here in the Richmond where businesses are wanting to expand that. And I'm in the middle of conversations through the Merchants Association I co-founded as well as as a business owner with businesses. And we've it's the answers have run the gamut, right? People, um, business owners, some people want it, some people don't. Customers, right, who need those parking spaces, they're actually giving feedback to businesses. Yes, do this, right? We, it's okay if we can't park, we'll come, right? Um, so I think it really requires that kind of process, which I would advocate for as supervisor. So short answer would be yes, um, with this kind of robust conversation, which is actually happening right now here in the Richmond. Timely question. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, we're gonna go to our last, last lightning round question. When Mark Farrell was briefly mayor of San Francisco in 2018, he tried pushing the city to build out broadband infrastructure to create public internet. With access to reliable internet becoming even more valuable during the pandemic, this conversation has begun to resurface. Do you support a San Francisco government owned public internet system? We'll start with you, Andrew. I'm going to say yes to that. Okay. Connie? Yes, but we need to do our homework to make sure that, you know, the technology is best served and that we really have the best equipment, so to speak, you know, to build out that infrastructure. Okay. David? Yes. Okay. Marjan? Yes. <laughs> We've got a winner here. here. Yes. <laughs> Veronica. Absolutely, yes. All right, thank you. Um, we are going to go to our audience questions. Hopefully we can wrap a little bit before the half hour because uh, a few of our folks have to jump off. Okay, we are going to start with you, Connie. Um, do you support the leadership the district has had these past four years, or would you do things a little differently from the current supervisor? As a reminder, we have 45 seconds for the audience question. Um, I do support um, not only Supervisor Sandra Lee Fewer, but also Supervisor Eric Marr and Supervisor um, Jake McGoldrey, uh, three predecessors or uh, previous supervisors in this district. I think they have done their best uh, making progress for the district and I really appreciate their work and, and also, you know, really appreciate their endorsement to our campaign. And I think that the things that I probably would do differently uh, than Supervisor Sandra Fewer, Fewer at this moment, it's really, um, it also also one of the reason why she encouraged me to run is the fact that I am by iterate, you know, um, and be able to speak Chinese fluently to almost 40% of the Chinese speaking residents in the Richmond. Um, but I, again, I really think that we have been making progress and uh, it's not perfect and more works need to be done. It's the reason why I'm running. Um, so yeah, that's where I am. Okay, David. Oh, can you repeat the question? Do you support the leadership the district has had these past four years or would you do things differently from the current supervisor? Um, absolutely, I would do some do it differently. I have noticed that uh, our current supervisor has not paid attention to the needs of our district. Um, we have, as an example, the homeless camp uh, at the Alexandria that was there until two days ago, uh, where our incumbent supervisor told told us, and I attended the town hall uh, that she held that uh, it was impossible to move that homeless camp because of a CDC recommendation that 
um, said that moving, doing so would spread the COVID-19. Yet two days ago, uh, neighbors uh, were able to get it done. So uh, I, would, I would be on the side of neighbors. I would be on the side of our district first. And that's what I would, that's the difference between myself and the incumbent. I'm for the Richmond first. Thank you. Marja? I do think we need a break from the status quo uh, in the Richmond. Um, I think that we need to do things differently. I think we haven't invested uh, in the right infrastructure and the right kind of um, neighborhood communication. I think our neighborhood is split. Many people don't have a seat at the table. And I think that we need a unified voice at City Hall. I know that's a tough thing to say in a campaign when a lot's going on, but um, that is something I'm committed to. I think that, you know, running, I'm running to serve as supervisor for everyone in the Richmond. And that means even if we disagree, we must keep those lines of conversation open and do things differently um, to achieve better results, not just for Richmond district residents, but for um, all residents in San Francisco. Thank you. Veronica? You know, if COVID-19 has taught us anything is that we weren't prepared. And we have, if you like politics as usual, you, you'll be happy with, you know, our past elected officials. The reality is I think we need something new. The issues that we're facing now from the unhoused population to housing are issues we have every election year for the past 20 plus years. So we need to move towards a new direction. And with COVID-19, it gives us an opportunity to really look deep into this election and elect someone who's gonna be a voice for everyone, everyone in our community, and who's gonna speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves particularly. So yes, we, we need a new direction. Andrew? Yeah, um, I would echo the sentiment of some of my, uh, some of my fellow candidates in, in the fact that we do need to go a new direction. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've obviously seen, and they have seen as well, um, the erosion of our, our district here in Richmond as far as homelessness, um, as far as affordable housing, um, and having a supervisor that's actually present. So I don't think just because you have the support of the incumbent makes you uniquely qualified uh, for, this, for this role. Um, we have issues in our district. We need to make sure that we're there specifically for the Richmond district, and that's who I'm looking to uh, support and be there for um, if, in fact, I'm elected to BOS for District 1. Thank you. Do you support a Muni Metro extension to the Richmond? We'll start with you, David. Yes, absolutely. The, the uh, Gary BRT uh, is one of my priorities uh, as a candidate. I believe that the Gary BRT needs to get built. We're into the second phase now. Um, I was a Gary um, user myself before COVID-19 because I worked in Oakland and it would take me sometimes an hour, an hour and a half just to get downtown to BART. Um, we also need to bring BART to the Richmond. Uh, it's been funded already. Uh, there's um, uh, funding available to extend BART into the western uh, parts of San Francisco. We've been talking about BART to the Richmond for decades. Uh, it needs to happen, um, we, and BART can connect us to the rest of the Bay Area, and it will be important, vitally important, for our economic recovery as a, as a district. Um, and I think it's, it's really critical that we build BART to the Richmond. Thank you. Marja? Uh, yes, we need to be, do better in reinforcing our transportation infrastructure. I think if you look at what transportation looks like in the city as a whole, it kind of looks like an unfinished project. Um, and, um, you know, as we look to diversify, serve more populations in our city, and as we emerge through this pandemic, you know, I believe San Francisco will come back and we will be stronger and we will weather this. Um, but we do need to ensure that we have the right infrastructure so we're not in the same situation 50, 60, 70 years from now. Uh, and we need to look at how we invest in transportation with an eye towards our local businesses to mitigate um, any type of negative impacts to our businesses. And that requires, you know, community participation, input, and real listening uh, from our local leaders so that we can get to where we need to be as a city. Veronica? You know, yes, with a caveat. As someone who takes the 38 care before COVID-19 and takes it now, we we need to, you know, re envision transportation. And the reality is, but currently San Francisco doesn't have any accountability or transparency when we have a transportation plan. So even before we set something in place, 
we can't redo what's happening on Van Ness. You know, a project that has no end in sight and has run out of money and has bankrupt so many businesses and made it extremely difficult for our senior population and our disabled population to get around. I don't want that to happen here in the Richmond district. It would be horrible. So yes, but with a caveat that we have accountability and transparency to make sure we have a start date and an end date and we have enough money to start and finish it. Thank you. Andrew? Um, yeah, so again, because of the pandemic, uh, our public transportation system ha obviously has been compromised. Uh, we need to look at public transportation in a new way, specifically in making sure that our community, our residents here, not only affordably, but safely. So we need to figure out a way to reimagine the way Muni is set up. If anybody's taking the bus downtown, I used to take the one um, downtown all the time to get to work um, every day and taking the 38 Geary downtown when you were just going for leisure opportunities. Um, it's not a safe, it's not a safe space to be. Um, and we also need to, um, I believe, expand uh, the Geary line um, so that it not only connects to downtown, but we also connect to Chinatown because we do have a huge Asian population here. And we want to make sure that all of our residents in Richmond District are able to get um, to Chinatown, to downtown, and back and forth um, whenever they need to. And I think it needs to also run um, all day and all night without restrictions. So that means the R bus, that means the BX line as well. Connie? Uh, yeah, definitely supportive of expansion of our uh, Metro and Muni uh, bus services. I know that, you know, that's including the Gary BRT that uh, it's currently in the works. Um, and in fact, that I think there's conversation right now. It's about the emergency transit only lane in, in the Richmond as well. And to see how we can through that during this pandemic to gather data and how can we make our transit options more efficient. Definitely. But I agree the fact that we need to really make sure that, you know, there is is a, uh, a mitigation plan on uh, mitigating, you know, community impacts on schools, neighbors, and small businesses. And definitely, we need to make sure that we hold SFMTA accountable to deliver on budget and on time. Thank you. All right, y'all have made it to the final question. What three words would you use to describe District 1? We'll start with you, Marjan. What? Um, beautiful, um, promise, um, future. Nice. Veronica? Um, inclusive, opportunity, and potential. Andrew? Uh, home, uh, beauty, Unfulfilled promise. Connie? We are diverse, we're inclusive, and I really do believe we are kind to one another. And David? Um, outdoorsy, fun, and uh, diverse. All right, we had a little bit of overlap there. Congratulations, everybody. You have survived all of our questions. We are gonna go to closing remarks now. Okay, you have two minutes for closing remarks. Um, we are going to start with you, Veronica. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us to introduce ourselves and our candidacy. It is an honor to be here. Again, I am born, I was born in Peru, raised here in the Richmond district. I have two sons, a 10 year old who's in public school and a 21 year old who's at City College. Both were learning from home. I understand the struggle of our gig economy is my son part-time does DoorDash and he um, has issues and we have discussions every day. But as a small business owner, I understand also the challenges as our business are having. But I also have two decades of working local and state government and I wanna bring my personal and government experience to City Hall to really make some promising changes for our community. So again, if you're tired of politics as usual and you want real change and a voice I'll represent everyone, please go to my website, veronicashinzato.com. Thank you. Andrew. Um, yeah, I'd like to start by thanking uh, SF City for holding this debate and allowing um, me as well as my fellow candidates uh, who are all worthy of, of, of the opportunity uh, to participate today as well as the hosts. 
Um, I'd like to start by saying that we, or myself specifically, um, running for the Board of Supervisors, again, is not about me. Um, I'm looking to represent the community that I've lived in for 15 years and to be able to provide um, the necessary uh, tools um, so that all of our community, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're middle class, you're low income, have the ability uh, to, live a, to live their dreams, to be able to afford to live here, to be able to thrive, to be able to raise their children, uh, for our small business owners to continue to be able to thrive post pandemic and during the pandemic to make sure that our community first and foremost is safe and healthy. Um, so if you want somebody that's independent, um, who doesn't have political ties, um, who loves their community, um, please vote for me for BOS uh, District 1 and visit me at www.voteandrewmajali.com. Thank you. Thank you. Connie? I'm a first generation immigrant. I came to San Francisco when I was 13 years old. My mom still live in the same rent control apartment that I grew up in in Chinatown. Um, I really uh, love it here and I grew up here and today that's where my partner at he's a firefighter uh, that we're able to afford our own home uh, in the Richmond because our family support and that's where we're also raising our second grader seven year old son together. Um, my 15 years more than 15 years of city government experience, you know, at the board supervisor I work for supervisor Sophie Maxwell shutting down the Marin's power plant uh, work for then a district attorney Kamala Harris, now super proud of her, our VP uh, candidate uh, for the Democratic Party, um, you know, about the early days of criminal justice reform and so glad that she also has endorsed our campaign. And the fact that, you know, also have work at Rex, SF Rec and Park advocating for more than $500 million uh, investment in our park system. And last but not least, you know, City College also champion the efforts to implement free city. Those are the skills that I think we need and that I can bring to the table to make sure that we get through the worst economy downturn at this moment, that we're facing this overwhelming deficit to make sure that our small business uh, can stay open tenants and homeowners on fixed income can stay housed. Those are the things that I can help San Francisco uh, if elected board of supervisors. So definitely look forward to having your support and uh, proud to be running uh, in this race with my fellow candidates here and uh, look forward to working with them no matter what. Thank you. Thank you. David? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jennifer, uh, for hosting this um, event. I. Um, uh, Born and raised in San Francisco, lived most of my life in the Richmond District, went to high school in the Richmond District um, at Wallenberg High School, and then uh, San Francisco State, where I teach political science there. I've taught there for over 15 years, almost 15 years now, and uh, where I've also worked in the Community College District uh, in Oakland and have um, work to register people to vote. Um, my wife and I started a small business here in the neighborhood in the Richmond District on Gary Boulevard uh, so over 10 years ago. It's still going strong. We serve neighbors here, uh, hire uh, people from the neighborhood to work in our small business. I raised my two kids here. Uh, this is my home and I'm running because uh, we need to uh, address the um, pandemic head on, which means uh, uh, opposing uh, tax increases that hurt our middle class and low income residents of the Richmond district, our struggling businesses. It means supporting a uh, BART to the Richmond, which is public uh, transportation at a critical time uh, when uh, our recovery depends upon it. It also means uh, uh, supporting small business, uh, cutting through red tape, helping small businesses uh, survive the pandemic and addressing the homeless issue in our district, but with smart solutions that uh, address the root problems uh, behind homelessness. And then finally, to uh, make sure that our district is put first. Uh, as supervisor, I will make the Richmond uh, my priority. Uh, the Richmond is my priority. Uh, and to make sure that uh, City Hall listens and we get the resources we need to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm running for supervisor because my husband and I are raising our three kids here. I want them to be able to raise 
there are hopefully three kids here. I want your kids to be able to live here. I want seniors to be able to continue to live here. And I think for the past 20, 30 years, we've been taking a cookie cutter approach to how we approach our economy, how we approach um, our unhoused residents, housing and transportation, these critical, critical um, infrastructure issues that will play an even more important role in the future of our city. You know, I have 30 years of experience working in government, working in communities and running two businesses. And I think now more than ever, we need that accountability and transparency at City Hall. You know, when I would when I would run my businesses, my first was a strategic communications firm and consulting firm. If people didn't like what I was selling, I'd be out of business. If I didn't meet the demand and meet the community and my clients where they were, we wouldn't have been in business. It's the same with retail. And I think government needs to look at that. What is the value of our government? There's a reason we call it public service. It's not public, this is what I think. It's public service because we're here to serve our communities. And I think we can do a much better job in including all voices in the neighborhood, focusing, yes, on the Richmond because we have district elections, but also understanding that we're part of a bigger community ecosystem here in the city. And we need to work together to get out of this mess that we're in. And we can't operate in silos. And we need to understand that there isn't one reason why we are where we are. And I think that kind of injects itself into the dialogue. It's this fault. It's because of this. If this were gone, everything would be fine. That's not just, the, that's just not the way it works. Um, you know, there are dozens and dozens of reasons why we are where we are. And I think we need to break with that status quo, look at, be open to new ideas and really roll up our sleeves together. And I think a supervisor can lead in that effort to wake up every day and tackle these problems with metrics to show the community how coming together can really make for a better city and a more productive city that serves everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you everybody for coming out to our first debate of the year. Just a reminder to everyone, this was recorded. So feel free to share it out. Uh, we will be emailing everybody as well. Uh, we will have a candidate questionnaire coming soon and Essex City will have lots of resources for the local election coming up in November. Local matters, do not forget to vote down the ballot. Thank you everyone. We will see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.